Though the year 1571 is not as well remembered as 1588, that year saw a momentous naval clash in the Ionian Sea between the naval forces of the Holy League, led by Don Juan of Austria, and those of the Ottoman Empire, led by Ali Pasha. The Holy League had initially been formed by Pope Pius V to aid the defenders of Famagusta against the Turks, and included among its members the Spanish Empire and the Republic of Venice. Though they were unable to prevent the fall of Cyprus, the Holy League drew the Ottoman fleet into battle on October 7th in the Gulf of Patras. Lepanto was the last major naval battle to feature oared galleys. One soldier from Spain, stricken with a fever and therefore free to remain below deck, insisted on participating in the battle as an arquebusier, where he sustained three wounds, two to the chest and one to his left hand that left it forever paralyzed, according to him, for the greater glory of the right. We have much reason to be grateful that the left hand was lost and not the right, but that soldier, Miguel Cervantes, is remembered today not for his martial feats, but for his novel, The Ingenious Gentleman, Don Quixote of La Mancha, published in two parts in 1605 and 1615, in which an aging Hidalgo, after reading too many books of knights and damsels, goes mad and sets out on a scrawny nag, donning rusted armor to set the world to rights. On his adventures, he is accompanied by his proverb-spewing squire, the corpulent Sancho Panza, and motivated by his love for the peasant girl, Aldonzo Lorenzo, imagined to be the lady Dulcinea del Toboso. Don Quixote is a satire of the chivalric romance, and perhaps of chivalry itself, written in a country where the crusading spirit was still strong. The irony that Cervantes should be the one to write this burlesque was noted in 1919 by G.K. Chesterton. Cervantes wrote a whole novel to show that it was nonsense to expect any adventures in this life, when his own life had been simply crammed with adventures. He seemed to smile Spain's chivalry away when he had actually been risking his life for that chivalry and driving its Paynim enemies away. At Lepanto, he was the first to leap, sword in hand, onto the galley of the Sultan, a thing obviously out of a boy's novelette. The first satirist of crusading romances was one of the last crusaders. When Don Quixote rides out onto the plains of La Mancha, images of windmills, blocks of sheep, goat herders, and fulling mills all belie the fact that this pastoral setting was in its day the heart of a globe bestriding empire. The process began with the union of the crowns of Castile and Aragon, through the marriage of their respective monarchs, Isabella and Ferdinand, the Catholic monarchs. The slow progress of the Reconquista, a series of campaigns by Christian kingdoms to recapture the Iberian Peninsula from the Muslims, or Moors, who had occupied most of it since the 8th century, culminated in January of 1492, when, after a ten-year war, the last Muslim kingdom in Iberia, the Emirate of Granada, surrendered to Ferdinand and Isabella. Emboldened by the victory, and with the support of the Inquisition, the monarchs then set in motion the forcible conversion of Spain's Muslim and Jewish population. Those who refused were expelled. This policy would reach its tragic denouement in 1609, when Philip III of Spain ordered the systematic removal of all Moriscos, the descendants of converted Muslims. This painful event is recounted in Don Quixote, when Sancho Panza encounters an old friend, the Morisco shopkeeper, Ricote, formerly expelled, but returned to Spain, disguised in a group of German pilgrims. You know very well, O oh Sancho Panza, my neighbor and friend, how the proclamation and edict that his majesty issues against those of my race brought terror and fear to all of us. It seems to me it was divine inspiration that moved his majesty to put into effect so noble a resolution not because all of us were guilty, for some were firm and true Christians, though these were so few they could not oppose those who were not, 
but because it is not a good idea to nurture a snake in your bosom or shelter enemies in your house. In short, it was just unreasonable for us to be chastised with the punishment of exile, lenient and mild according to some, but for us it was the most terrible we could have received. No matter where we are, we weep for Spain, for, after all, we were born here, and it is our native country. Present at the surrender of Granada was a navigator from Genoa, who convinced Isabella to support a speculative voyage to investigate whether a viable route to the Indies could be found by sailing westwards. As far as Christopher Columbus was concerned, his voyage would strengthen Christian alliances against Islam, facilitate the recapture of Jerusalem from the back door, as it were, and generate enough income that it would pay for itself. Though Washington Irving would later portray Columbus as an Enlightenment precursor, out to disprove the flat-earth dogmas of the Church, he was, in reality, a kind of Quixote, a few centuries behind his time, in the words of one historian, one who underestimated the circumference of the Earth, something that was already known in his day, along with its rotundity, and would have surely died had not there been a continent, unknown to Europeans, conveniently blocking his path. Among Columbus's documented character traits, we have a credulous and overtaxed imagination, a great fondness for ceremonies of naming, an alertness to the appearances of enchantment, ideology based on prescience rather than experience, a tendency to adjust the data, as well as challenge the humanity of informants bearing unwelcome intelligence, a penchant for imposing oaths on other people, and finally, a kind of injudicious bookishness. In addition to all of this, in his role as Admiral of the Ocean Sea, Columbus was quick to dole out islands with tens of thousands of inhabitants to subordinates as a display of largesse. In the same mode, Don Quixote persuades the peasant, Sancho, to join him on his second sally by promising him an island to govern. Senor Knight Errant, be sure not to forget what your grace promised me about the insula. I'll know how to govern it, no matter how big it is. You must know, friend Sancho Panza, it was a very common custom of the knights errant of old to make their squires governors of the insulas or kingdoms they won, and I have resolved that so amiable a usage will not go unfulfilled on my account. On the contrary, I plan to approve upon it, for they sometimes, and perhaps most times, waited until their squires were old, and after they had had their fill of serving, and enduring difficult days, and knights that were even worse, they would grant them the title of Count, or perhaps even of Marquis, of some valley or province of greater or smaller size. But if you live, and I live, it well might be that before six days have passed I shall win a kingdom that has others allied to it, and that would be perfect for my crowning you king of one of them. And do not think this is any great thing, for events and eventualities befall knights in ways never seen or imagined. I might well be able to give you even more than I have promised. If that happens, and I become king through one of those miracles your grace has mentioned, then Juana Gutierrez, my missus, would be queen, and my children would be princes. Well, who can doubt it? I doubt it, because in my opinion, even if God rained kingdoms down on earth, none of them would sit well on the head of Marie Gutierrez. You should know, senor, that she isn't worth two Maravetis as a queen. She'd do better as a countess, and even then, she'd need God's help. Leave it to God, Sancho, and he will give what suits her best. But do not lower your desire so much that you will be content with anything less than the title of Captain General. I won't, senor, especially when I have a master as distinguished as your grace. Who will know how to give me everything that's right for me and that I can handle? In his log entry for Wednesday, January 9th, 1493, Columbus, speaking of himself in the third person, wrote, On the previous day, when the admiral had gone to the Rio del Oro, he said he saw three mermaids that came very high up out of the sea. 
But they were not so beautiful as they are depicted, for only after a fashion had human form in their faces. He said that he had seen some on other occasion in Guinea, on the coast of Malagata. Like Quixote, who could mistake windmills and wineskins for giants, it seems that Columbus mistook manatees for mermaids, and died believing that he had in fact reached Asia, and not stumbled upon the shores of the Bahamas. It is interesting to note that the same books that drove Don Quixote mad were read by the Spanish conquistadors, who soon followed after Columbus in his 1565 book, The Conquest of New Spain, Bernal Diaz, alluding to the fantastical lands that appear in the romances of chivalry, describes the experience of first sighting Tenochtitlan as he and the rest of Cortez's men entered the Valley of Mexico. When we saw all those cities and villages built on water, and the other great towns on dry land, and that straight and level causeway leading to Mexico, we were astounded. These great towns and shrines and buildings, rising from the water, all made of stone, seemed like an enchanted vision from the tale of Amadis. Indeed, some of our soldiers asked whether it was not all a dream. It is not surprising, therefore, that I should write in this vein. It was also wonderful that I do not know how to describe this first glimpse of things never heard, or never seen, and never dreamed of before. Amadis, of course, refers to the first great chivalric romance published in Spain, Amadis of Gaul. It is likely that the name of the Sunshine State is derived from one of these romances, the adventures of Esplandian, as California is named as an island east of the Indies near the earthly paradise, ruled over by the Queen Calafia and her black Amazons. Quixote, in one of his discourses with Sancho, includes Cortes, the conqueror of Aztec Mexico, and a long list of classical heroes who exemplify worldly fame. I mean, Sancho, that the desire to achieve fame is extraordinarily active. What do you think made Horatius leap from the bridge dressed in all his armor into the depths of the Tiber? What burned the arm and hand of Mucius? What impelled Curtius to throw himself into the deep, burning abyss that opened in the center of Rome? What, against all the unfavorable omens that had appeared, drove Caesar to cross the Rubicon? And, with more modern examples, what scuttled the ships and left the valiant Spaniards, led by the gallant Cortes, stranded and isolated in the new world. All these and many other great feats are, were, and will be the works of fame, which mortals desire as a reward and as part of the immortality which their famous deeds deserve, though we, as Christians, Catholics, and knights-errant, must care more for future glory eternal in the ethereal and celestial spheres than for the vanity of the fame achieved in this present and transitory world. This fame, no matter how long it may last, must finally come to an end with the world itself, whose end has been determined. And so, O Sancho, our actions must not go beyond the limits placed there by the Christian religion which we profess. We must slay pride by slaying giants, slay envy with generosity and a good heart, anger with serene bearing and tranquility of spirit, gluttony and sleep, by eating little and washing always, lust and lasciviousness by maintaining our fealty towards those whom we have made mistresses of our thoughts, sloth by wandering everywhere in the world, seeking those occasions when we may become famous knights as well as Christians. Here you see, Sancho, the means by which one attains the highest praise that comes with fame and a good name. In 1504, Queen Isabella died, leaving the kingdom of Castile to her daughter, Joanna the Mad. As you can probably guess, Joanna was deemed unfit to rule, so Ferdinand reigned as regent until he died in 1516. The crowns of both Castile and Aragon passed to Joanna's 17-year-old Flemish son, who became the Habsburg king, Carlos I of Spain. In 1519, the Holy Roman Emperor died, 
the two favorite candidates for this elective monarchy were Francis I of France and Carlos I of Spain. Using his connections to the German banking house of Fugger, Carlos outbribed his opponents, and the princely electors crowned him Emperor Charles V. Still a teenager, Charles was the most powerful man in the world, ruler of Germany, Austria, Bohemia, Flanders, the Netherlands, Spain, and all of Spanish America. Don Quixote, meditating on eternal fame, recounts a story about Charles V visiting the Pantheon in Rome. And also to the point is what happened to the great emperor Charles V and a gentleman in Rome. The emperor wished to see the famous Temple of the Rotunda, which in antiquity was called Temple of All the Gods, and today is known by the holier name of All Saints, and is the most complete surviving building of all those erected by the Gentiles in Rome. And the one that best preserves the fame of its founders for grandeur and magnificence. It has the shape of half an orange and is extremely large, and it is well lit though the only light is from a window, or rather, a round skylight at the top. And it was there then that the emperor looked down at the building, and at his side was a Roman gentleman who pointed out the beauties and subtleties of the great structure and its memorable architecture. And when they had come down, he said to the emperor, A thousand times, most sacred majesty, I have felt the desire to embrace your majesty and then throw myself down from that skylight so my fame in the world will be eternal. The emperor responded, I thank you for not having put so wicked a thought into effect, and from now on, I shall not give you occasion to test your loyalty. I command you never to speak to me again, or to be anywhere I am. And with these words, he performed a great service for him. Charles's dream of universal empire, however, soon ran up against geopolitical reality. His 39-year reign saw a series of wars with France and the capture of Francis I at the Battle of Pavia, the advance of the Ottoman Empire into Europe after Suleiman the Magnificent's victory at Mohaj, and the beginning of the Protestant Reformation in Germany, where the young emperor was present at Luther's defense of his teachings at the Imperial Diet of Worms. Charles was able to fight his infidel enemies, be they Turk or Protestant, thanks to the riches of the Americas particularly the silver mines of Potosi in modern-day Bolivia. Its wealth is referenced by Don Quixote as he and Sancho haggle over an appropriate price for Sancho to flog himself in an attempt to disenchant the Lady Dulcinea. If I were to pay you, Sancho, according to what the greatness and nobility of this remedy deserve, the treasure of Venice and the mines of Potosi would not be enough. Estimate how much of my money you are carrying, and then set a price for each lash. This lucre came at an immense human cost, however, as the encomienda system granted individuals the right to exact tribute or forced labor from the indigenous populations. One of the most outspoken critics of the system was a Dominican friar, Bartolome de las Casas, who argued against it in the Valladolid debates. In 1542, the emperor promulgated the new laws of the Indies for the good treatment and preservation of the Indians, which sought to rein in the excess of the encomienda system. Unfortunately, it was unenforceable where imperial authority did not reach, and where it did, landowners soon found a replacement for indigenous labor, the Atlantic slave trade. When Don Quixote sets off to aid the princess of Micomicon, Sancho, thinking that at long last he may have a kingdom to govern, regrets that Mycomicon is a kingdom of black Africans. He comforts himself with the thought that he can simply sell his vassals into slavery. What difference does it make to me if my vassals are black? All I have to do is put them on a ship and bring them to Spain, where I can sell them, and I'll be paid for them in cash. And with that money, I'll be able to buy some title or office and live on that for the rest of my life. No flies on me. Who says I don't have the wit or ability to arrange things and sell 30 or 10,000 vassals in the wink of an eye? By God, I'll sell them all, large or small. It's all the same to me. And no matter how black they are, I'll turn them white and yellow. Bring them on, I'm no fool. 
In 1556, Charles V abdicated the Spanish throne in favor of his son, Philip II, and, leaving the Holy Roman Empire to his brother Ferdinand, he retired to a monastery in Spain until his death in 1558. Philip, who was educated in Spain, established his capital at Madrid and operated the workings of the empire out of an office in the Escorial. Though the Spanish Empire would reach its height under Philip, as he acquired Portugal and its American holdings in 1580, his failed attempt to stamp out the Dutch Revolt in what proved to be an 80-year war came at enormous cost to his subjects, including Cervantes, whose brother Rodrigo would die fighting there. Philip, a staunch opponent of the Protestant Reformation, was not hesitant to employ the Inquisition against those he suspected of unorthodoxy. In an attempt to bring Protestant England back into the Catholic fold, stop their support of the Dutch rebels, the Spanish Armada sailed in 1588, intent on invasion, but was destroyed by storms as it sailed around the British Isles. This defeat contrasted greatly with the victory won at Lepanto by Don Juan of Austria, who happened to be the illegitimate son of Charles V, and therefore the half-brother of Philip, who never matched his half-brother's popularity in Christendom. When Philip II died in 1598, a huge catafalque was erected in his honor in Seville. Catafalque became the subject of a poem by Cervantes. I swear to God, such grandeur frightens me. I'd pay good money to describe it well. For whom would this great structure, all this wealth, not hold in wonder with its awesome spell? By Christ alive, each part of it is worth more than a million. Isn't it a shame that it won't last a century? Great Seville, triumphant Rome in zeal and noble fame. I'll bet the very soul of this here corpse, just to enjoy this spot today, has quit that heaven where it endlessly resides. A braggart overheard these words and said, Oh, Mr. Soldier, what you say is true, and anyone who says it's not, he lies. And then, quite suddenly, he checked his sword with care, pulled down his hat, he looked away, moved on, and that was that. His successor, Philip III, was a weak king, more interested in hunting and art collecting, who delegated authority to court favorites, like the Duke of Lerma. His reign saw a period of imperial retrenchment, as it became apparent that Spain was overstretched and under-resourced. It was during this period of Spanish decline that Don Quixote became one of the earliest bestsellers. According to one likely apocryphal story, King Philip, standing one day on the balcony of the Palace of Madrid, observed a student with book in his hand on the opposite bank of the river. He was reading, but every now and then he interrupted his reading and gave himself violent blows upon the forehead accompanied with innumerable motions of ecstasy and mirthfulness. That student, said the king, is either out of his wits or reading Don Quixote. The year of Cervantes' birth, 1547, was propitious for Spain. Francis I, King of France and rival of Charles V, died, plunging his kingdom into a half-century of religious turmoil. In England, King Henry VIII, once called Defender of the Faith by Pope Leo X, died after declaring himself Supreme Head of the Church of England. And at Mulberg in Germany, a year after the heretic Luther was silenced by a stroke, imperial troops won a victory over the Lutheran princes of the Schmalkaldic League. Even in far-off Muscovy, Ivan the Terrible, newly named Tsar of all Russia, began applying pressure against the Ottoman Turks that would forestall their drive in the Mediterranean, ensuring that when the Battle of Lepanto was fought, Miguel would be old enough to fight in it. The actual day of Cervantes' birth is unknown, but September 29th, the Feast of St. Michael, is suggested by the Spanish custom that tended to name each child for the saint commemorated on the day of his birth. Born in Alcalá de Henares, a university town 20 miles east of Madrid, he was the fourth of seven children in a minor gentry family, fallen on hard times. When contemporaries were asked whether the Cervantes were noble or not, they said they never seemed to pay taxes, 
they dressed in silk, and that their sons were often to be seen jousting on good and powerful horses. The father, Rodrigo, was a barber surgeon who likely performed bloodlettings in basins like the one mistaken by Don Quixote for the mythical Helmet of Mambrino. The family moved frequently to cities like Valladolid, Cordova, and Seville, and little is known of the young Cervantes' education. There is a record that around the age of 20, he studied for six months under the humanist priest Juan Lopez de Hoyos, who referred to Cervantes as his beloved pupil. In 1569, he contributed four poems to a volume compiled by Lopez de Hoyos in honor of the dead queen, Elizabeth of Valois. In September of that year, an arrest warrant was issued after he wounded a man in a duel, and he was banished from Spain for ten years, ironically, on pain of losing his right hand. Fleeing to Italy, he found work serving in the household of a cardinal, where he was initiated into the world of Italian literature. In 1570, he joined a Spanish regiment in Naples, signing up as a naval gunner. Don Quixote's description of boarding an enemy ship at sea was clearly drawn from the author's experience at Lepanto. And if this seems an insignificant danger, let us see if it is equaled or surpassed when the prows of two galleys collide in the middle of the wide sea. For when they lock and grapple, the soldier is left with no more than two feet of plank on the ram of the ship. Despite this, seeing that he has in front of him as many ministers of death threatening him as there are artillery cannons aimed at him on the other side, only a lance's throw away, and seeing that at the first misstep he will visit the deep bosom of Neptune. Despite this, with an intrepid heart, carried by the honor that urges him on, he makes himself the target of all their volleys, and attempts to cross that narrow passage to the enemy vessel. And the most astounding thing is that no sooner does one man fall, not to rise again until the world comes to an end, than another takes his place. And if he too falls into the sea, that waits just like an enemy, there is another, and another who follows him, and in their deaths come one after the other, without pause. No greater valor and daring can be found in all the perils of war. Quixote then goes on to decry the discovery that has transformed warfare and rendered his heroic mode of chivalry obsolete, gunpowder. Happy were those blessed times that lacked the horrifying fury of the diabolical instruments of artillery, whose inventor, in my opinion, is in hell, receiving the reward for his accursed invention, which allows an ignoble and cowardly hand to take the life of a valiant knight, so that, not knowing how it comes, or from where, a stray shot is fired into the courage and spirit that inflame and animate a brave heart, sent by one who perhaps fled in fear of the bright flare when the damned machine discharged it, and it cuts off and ends in an instant the thoughts and life of one who deserved to enjoy many more long years. When I consider this, I am prepared to say that it grieves my very soul that I have taken up the profession of knight-errant in an age as despicable as the one we live in now. For although no danger can cause me to fear, it still fills me with misgivings to think that powder and tin may deprive me of the opportunity to become famous and renowned throughout the world for the valor of my arm and the sharp edge of my sword. But God's will be done for I shall be more highly esteemed if I succeed in my purpose for having confronted greater dangers than any faced by the knights of old. As Cervantes was returning from Spain in 1575, his galley was waylaid by Barbary pirates, and he was taken to Algiers as a captain for five years, until his family, aided by the convent of barefoot Trinitarians, was able to pay his ransom. He returned to Spain, twelve years after leaving it, not to a hero's welcome, but to poverty. Stuck in an unhappy marriage to a woman eighteen years his junior, and with an illegitimate daughter in his care, Cervantes sought help from the crown in applying for a position in New Spain. Despite his service, he was refused, and instead wound up traipsing across Andalusia as a tax collector, gathering provisions for the Invincible Armada. He was eventually put in prison after some 
irregularities were found in his account. According to the prologue of Part 1 of the Quixote, it was during this period of imprisonment that the idea for the novel first came to him. The Spanish conquest of America had a paradoxical effect. The silver and gold bullion that poured into Spain had a devastating effect as inflation soared and many who once worked the land were driven into the cities. The social forces unleashed by the rise and eventual decline of Spain would find expression in the literature that preceded and influenced the Quixote. We hope you'll join us next time as we take a more in-depth look at these predecessors. From the picaresque novels, Lazario del Tormes and La Celestina, to the epic poems Orlando Furioso and Jerusalem Delivered. And, of course, we'll look into some of the many romances of chivalry and find out just what it is about them that drive a man to madness.